<laughs> hey, Biddy. Hey, Biddy. How are you? <laughs> Pretty good. Hanging in there. Did yeah. you like my new dance? I just made that up for you. I did. I know, usually I kind, I kind of hide them on the YouTube so people might not know what we're talking about. <laughs> the awkward head bobbing we do as we count down um, to recording time. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but yeah, back again with the passport tour, diving into yeah. South Africa today. Which is actually one of the new, like less known ones to me. I did go to South Africa two years ago now, I believe it was, and did a day in wine country and pretty much only drank South African wine down there. But still, I don't know as much about it as I should, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, you'll have a leg up on me because I've never been. I've been at some restaurants that did serve some South African wines, and I did... I, was it a New World Old Rep? I forget which episode, but we'll link it in the show notes. But there was one of the other episodes that I did have a South African Chenin Blanc on. So that was really my most recent foray into South African wines. And we'll touch on that briefly again in this episode. Um, but yeah, but it's kind of, it bridges like New World, Old World, because it does have such like a long winemaking history. It does. It's been around for a long time and it definitely has had kind of a roller coaster. So that's why I think getting to know... South African wine today is a little bit harder because of just kind of all of the battles they've gone through with it. Right. It sounds like there's been different reputations for it. And like, you know, in the most recent history, it wasn't sort of seen as like the most reputable wine. So sort of mass produced, but that's changed. And going back, they actually did have more of a, oops, sorry, I hit the mic there. Um, <laughs> more of a winemaking tradition um, within dessert yeah. wine. It definitely the dessert wine, the uh, Vindic Estance and Castancha. And actually, I have a bottle of that, but I just that I brought back from South Africa. But I just really wasn't in the mood to drink a whole bottle of dessert <laughs> wine tonight by myself on a hot day. <laughs> All right, but yeah, so South Africa mostly settled and colonized by Dutch um, sort of immigrants back in the 1600s. Mm-hmm. So 1650s, they started uh, wine production in South Africa. Um, but I guess they didn't have a ton of knowledge of wine. The Netherlands not being a huge wine growing country itself. <laughs> so, uh, I guess the it's French the Huguenots, nuts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they said they're, they're, they're tulips, not their grapes. Uh, but the French Huguenots, um, is it Huguenots or Huguenots? Huguenots. No. French still escaping us. Although that's like a major historical movement that I should be more familiar with as a history major. But anyway, there were French people who were of a specific religious and philosophical proclivity and they came to South Africa in the 1600s um in the latest in the 1680s and they sort of brought winemaking skills with them so yeah and then I mean what was it the late in the 1800s sometime is that when they had that um big phylloxera, phylloxera outbreak right so sometime between like the late 1600s and then in the um mid 1800s so sometime yeah. in there, they got really big, mostly for dessert wine, like the yeah. wine you just mentioned. And like, we're very well known, like people know like Madeira and some of these other sweet wines. Um, I guess South Africa was really well known for it. Um, and we yeah. don't know that today because of phylloxera. <laughs> so the Vinda Castance that we were talking about, like that being so well known before the phylloxera outbreak, that was actually supposedly Napoleon's favorite wine was the Vinda Castance um, dessert wine, or at least that's what I learned when I was down there. And then also, I believe Jane Austen wrote about it in one of her books, saying sure. that the wines from Constantia and especially the Vinda Castance um, is capable of curing a broken heart. Oh. So <laughs> I think there's two major producers who do it now Groot Castancha and Klein Castancha are the two wineries that make it still now. Or today, we kind of brought it back. And I think my bottle's from Klein, but I have to double check. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, so I guess Phylloxera devastated most of the wine that was there. Um, and then they replanted in the early 1900s. Yeah, and that's where they kind of took a hit to their reputation. Because in 1918, um, because of the Phylloxera outbreak, they had lost most of their export market. And then um, a group was created and the abbreviation is KWV but I'm not going to even try to pronounce Afrikaans because that's the Afrikaans abbreviation but essentially it translates to the Cooperative Winemakers Union of South Africa and they establish a way to produce wine like replant grapes make brandy and then stabilize the pricing on it but the biggest problem with them was that it was more emphasizing quality over quantity so that's where South Africa kind of took this like eh everyday drinking, not super exciting, not very great wine. And then a lot of brandy was made there too. So still sweet, but not as well known, just 
sort of going for. And I think that mass production model lasted for a very long time. Because when I was looking at the research, even for Pinotage, which I'll be discussing sort of towards the end of tonight's episode, um, is that Pinotage has had a reputation for being sort of mass produced, Mm -hmm. just not really reputable wine. And that's changed recently as well. Um, And the other big problem that happened with them, and like now that's why we're, I think when we're talking about how we're starting to finally get nice South African wine and you're not just getting all of the basic table wine and just mass produced stuff. When I was down there, there's some really cool wine. Um, a lot of places would allow for trade with South Africa until apartheid was done. So they weren't exporting oh, yeah. wine around the world because of apartheid and that ended in the early 1990s. So that was the first time that they were able to start opening their borders for trade because other countries were allowing that. And um, that's when they discovered that they were like vastly behind as far as wine technology went and just kind of understanding what was better and different winemaking practices. So they're kind of still up and coming, I think, in a lot of their respects. And that's why we're starting to see better things coming out of South Africa. Interesting. So like the contemporary wine has sort of been on a bit of a curve and growth because of the uh, export market being shut down. Yeah. Um, And I think I'll be interested to see how even some South African goes for a little bit. I think I heard, and this might be like completely made up, but I think with COVID, they actually like kind of just like shut down their export altogether. Hmm. They just were like, meh, like we're not going to do this trade stuff right now. So they weren't exporting wines a lot this year, at least to my knowledge. But I guess I, I could I, see that if it wasn't like a yeah. major moneymaker and if people aren't like super missing South African wines. Although like Shannon Blanc has become one of my like favorite whites. So yeah, it's so refreshing. Be sad. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I mean, the interesting thing that I was looking at, if you move in, then into like what they are producing now, um, and I was reading that like South Africa it is interesting that export as much is one of the larger producers in the world. It's like fifth or something. But they're yeah, pretty they're, big. It's like in they're the second half of the top ten, but like fifth, sixth, seventh, or something like that. I think. Yeah. So yeah, so that's still pretty big. And considering, like, then if you look at the the regions, they actually don't produce wine. I mean, it's not a huge country, and they don't produce it all over across the entire country. It's really just on the Western Cape and this one little section along. It's called the Orange River, which I have no knowledge of. I don't know if you were anywhere near. Were you near no, the Orange I, River when you were there? No. <laughs> <laughs> I stay like in like Stellenbosch and like Casanta, like that kind of area. Um, because we just did a day trip from we had this guy who was amazing. His name was John. And John had a lot of patience for us. His three girls on a girls' trip with no driver. I mean, like he was our driver, so he could take us to all these wineries and we could just like booze. So it was a long day, but it was good. Um, but we stayed in like the Stella Mosh region for the most okay, part. Okay, so that's more, yeah, more Western Western Cape, um, where most of the wine is. Um, yeah. And I guess, you know, it lends itself to, it, you can create a bunch of different styles of wine there because it is a little bit, um, like the growing areas are very differentiated. They have mountains, they have valleys, um, plateaus, um, all sorts of different Yeah, because it's, it's on one of the sides of uh, Table Mountain. It's like the big mountain, like right at the edge of Cape Town. Because we, I went up it one day. It's really pretty. But also the thing I learned about like the wine growing regions, it's not growing everywhere in the country because South Africa is one of the wine making regions that has a lot of the land outside the normal parallels that wine is growing at like 30 to whatever 50 degree like latitude lines or something. Um, but it's also most of their wines are grown in the Cape Floral Kingdom, which is one of six UNESCO uh, biodiversity hotspots. So almost all the grapes are grown in this region. Essentially what a floral kingdom is, is that 70% of the plants in this kingdom are not found anywhere else in the world except for this biodiverse area that also happens to grow most of South Africa's wine grapes. So are any of the grapes indigenous and like super special or is, I mean, the ones that you come across any of that, it's no, just they're, they're flourishing amongst all these other cool. Yeah. Other, other cool things. things. I mean, cause mostly they're growing a lot of the old world stuff, Cab, uh, Syrah, Merlot, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc. Um, they have Pinotage, which we're going to talk about, which is a hybrid grape, not a hybrid. It's um, the baby grape of Pinot Noir and Cinso. And then they also have one called Ruby Cabernet, which is a mix of Cabernet and Carignan. So they have I really some... want to try that one. I'm sorry I couldn't yeah. find something like that. 
I've never heard of one. I even asked my psalm friend. I was like, have you heard of a ruby cab? And he was like, nope. And I was like, I guess it's like a grape that's in South Africa. And I never saw it when I was down there. So I really yeah. don't know how big it is. But it was on the list of like top varietals for reds in South Africa. Yeah, and I, I, I saw that when you added it to the notes. And I was like, bummer. Because I did um go to sort of the nice little wine shop here in Astoria that I think has a really solid selection of different regions. And um, we actually, we had to reschedule this episode. So originally I had a pure since so, and then I went back and I have a Pinot Tage. Um, yeah. But I was going through all the bottles. I, I did not see a Ruby Cabernet there. So no, maybe they don't no. export it. No, no, actually, maybe after this, I'll like do some research even see if you can find one in the U.S. or if it's like, if, if it's mostly just a blending grape, like I have no idea. It was just like on the list from my certified wine specialist textbook that I studied from when I took that exam. Well, it sounds special. I wish that I had one. Yeah, it's so <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but I think that's kind of the cool thing is like, um, so Pinotage being this like unique grape, which we'll get into because I do have one, but it's red. So it'll be at the, the back of our lineup. Um, so obviously those are all like a lot of red grapes we just mentioned, but actually the majority slightly of grapes in South Africa grown are white. Um, the leader being Chenin and Blanc, mm-hmm. um, which is called which, Steen down there. Steen. Steen. S-T-E-E-N. Sounds, sounds very clean. Yes. And, yeah, clean. and because it's the summer and I recently discovered, which you're familiar with, you shared, um, this Lubanzi Chenin and Blanc can, um, which is just like really delicious, super gulpable Chenin and Blanc. Um, I keep on like Chenin Blanc, it's, this is like a very unsophisticated way of describing it, but it sort of reminds me of like the Chenin Blanc, the one I had on the previous episode that I've had a bunch of times since is a Bellingham estate Chenin Blanc in the bottle. This one is the Lubanzi in the can and they're very similar in taste, but they're, um, they remind me of like a cross between like an old world, like French Chardonnay, like a white Burgundy and a Sauvignon Blanc. Like yeah. they have some of that like finesse and crispness to them, but also with a bit of weight and then a little bit of that like fruit. I don't know. It's just like, they're very, I think, approachable and likable. And I, they've become like one of my favorite, just mm-hmm. like drinking whites. Um, so I wanted to, it's, it's summertime. And even though I, I did enjoy, I've been sipping that Pinot Tau since last night. Um, I have enjoyed that a lot, but I did want to to have some some white wine. Plus, we actually had fish for dinner tonight, so the Pinot Tau would not have gone well with that. So, um, <laughs> Ch- Chenin Blanc worked. Um, but yeah, just like a super lovely one. We talk a bit more about it, and um, I think it's an old world versus new world. So yeah, that's one because I had a French Chenin Blanc. Right. Okay. So we'll link. I don't know what number that one is anymore. Five. 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 I think it's five. I think five. it's five. Um, we'll link to that somewhere in here. Um, if you want to learn more about Chenin Blanc, we just want to touch on that in this episode, since I had the cool can and it is the predominant white grape, um, down there. And, um, like going off of that, like I actually just started reading a really cool book called grasping the grape and it breaks down literally every chapter is one of the major wine grapes and a really cool, concise, like, I don't know, history of them, where they're grown, like some fun facts about them. So we should link that one too, because I've been reading it this week. Although for my grape that I drank today, it's not major enough to be listed. So I was like, oh. But Shannon Blanc's in there? Is being super young. Uh, there should be actually. Yeah, I think Shannon Blanc was in there. But we, yeah, I, like Shannon Blanc is like one of my go-tos to find on any wine list right now. Just like easy to drink. Like you said, Steen is clean. It's easy to drink. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's yep. hot where you've been. It's hot where I am. So yeah. And you have a rosé tonight. I do. So I um, actually purchased this back up in Denver from um, one of my favorite wine bars up there called Noble Riot. And um, it's called Lazy Lucy. Here's the label. Ooh, it's pretty it's, juicy looking yeah. too. It is juicy. And it's, um, so I was actually having a hard time because this is a 2019 wine. And the website that they distribute through, um, they only had notes for 2018 and I saw some notes for 2017. So the blend has changed every year in it, but it's mostly Cinso. And then it sounds like a little bit of Syrah as well. So mm-hmm. I don't know like the exact mixing on it, but that's what it is. So this is from the Western Cape region. I mean, major area it's in from Parle, um, which I, I mean, it's P-A-A-R-L. I don't really know. I think it sounds like Parle. I mean, I don't really know how else I could pronounce that, but it's made by Blackwater Wines. And Kara, dude, this guy is so fucking hot. <laughs> I don't know about a picture of him. <laughs> yeah, I was like on the, so their website was functioning for me at the time, but I found it through like their importer or something like that. It's this guy named Francois Hasbrook, which mm. 
French first name, Dutch or kind of more Afrikaans. I mean, that's kind of where Afrikaans comes from is, is Dutch background, right? That language. Yeah. It's very similar. So I'm, I'm liking that. Francois Hasbrook. Hasbrook. Um, and in my notes are super hot in parentheses. So we made sure we touched on another wine stud and maybe he'll he may, may, maybe we'll put a photo of him in the, yeah, maybe. <laughs> in the wine notes. So he's from, um, he's originally from Stellenbosch, but he worked at Dry Creek Vineyards in Sonoma. So really well known there. Jackson State and Marlboro. Um, and then he went back to South Africa and started working at a company called Waterford Wine Estate before he started Blackwater Wines. Um, so this is in so and Sorrel, like I said, um, it's just like, one of those porch pounders it's like super juicy and jammy and quenchable um and since so it's kind of an odd grape it's declining rapidly in vineyard space around the world right now it's originally from the rhone valley so it's again a french grape um it usually was blended up there with like grenache or syrah or mabed so the syrah pairing in this makes total sense um but it's like what we said earlier one of the parent grapes to pinotage and I don't know if it's like the mother or the father or whatever. Or <laughs> which one's the boy grape and which one's the girl grape? <laughs> but um, it was actually, so there's like some confusion about it. It was originally called Hermitage in South Africa. And that's also a wine region in France, but that's also not associated with the Cinso grape necessarily. Um, and it can be found in Australia, but it's actually kind of more commonly found in like different wine regions like Corsica, Lebanon. Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria, and South Africa. So it seems odd. Like, so why is it it's losing vineyard space overall, but it's grown in these bizarre places? Yeah, and I, I think it's it's even declining. I think in South Africa as well. But it's used in a lot of rosés. Like I think it is used one, in a lot of rosés. Yeah. So now, which one? I feel like whenever I move, my headphones moving. Sorry, if that's affecting sound. But um, but yeah, but I think the um. One of the the Austrian rosé I had, I think, had the Cistercian. I think it was Cinso and Saint Laurent. Something else. Yeah. It's just yeah. a very small. I mean, I feel like I I don't know. I'm sure there are 100 percent Cinso rosés, but not, but maybe not. But this one is Cinso dominant for the most part. Um, and it's a lot of the times since Cinso has been added, it's been for rosé production, and it's mostly to add perfume and like fruitiness, like just immediate fruit. So that's why it is oh. here jammy style it does have that tendency as a grape so it does add that kind of stuff so it's super common but I it's like apparently everyone just kept saying it's like not that common anymore or like it's still common enough but it is decreasing in total acreages around the entire world hmm. the girl in the U.S. too uh, it used to be called black Mal- malvoisie oh in yeah. the United States in the United States and that was the 1860s in California where it started I don't know black malvoisie <laughs> It's an odd grape with like an odd background and there are some weird names that kind of confuse people for a little bit depending on where they were. But this Lazy Lucy Rosé is like perfect for when it's 110 degrees outside like it is. It sounds like it sounds like the name too if this fits. Lazy Lucy. It's 110 where I am in Tucson right now. It's I'm lazy AF because I don't want to fucking go outside. (laughs) And like this is just like juicy and jammy. Like I just work all day from the air conditioning inside of this house drinking some lazy lucy <laughs> yeah pretty much it's perfect lazy lucy <laughs> for a lazy cala <laughs> yeah um yeah so chinso then as you, we've mentioned a few times made a baby with pinot noir and that's mm-hmm. primarily because um pinot noir just didn't grow well in it's south like, africa yeah pinot noir like we've said before it's such a bitch of a grape to deal with it's like well, I think I said, baby yeah it's the millennial of grapes it's all like sensitive <laughs> But Sideways made it, that movie made it seem like the end-all be-all of life. Um, it's, it's a nice grape, it is. <laughs> you do a good Pinot Noir, like you've mastered it. Like it's just because it's such a hard grape to deal with. So good Pinot is like something super special. So, yeah, but I can probably. see why it wouldn't do well in South Africa where most of their region is outside of like ideal climbing or growing areas for them. Right. So that's, I mean, in 1925, a scientist, not necessarily a winemaker or wine grower, but a scientist named Abraham Harold, he, I guess, was frustrated that Pinot Noir did not grow well in South Africa and I guess maybe liked Pinot Noir in general. So he decided to cross it with Chinso or Chinso, which did very well. It's a sort of a good grower. Mm-hmm. Um, so he crossed the two of them to try to like sort of give Pinot Noir some of that hardiness and that's where Pinotage came from 
Um, I'm going to pour myself some of mine since I had some of that Chenin Blanc. I'm that not using it, a new glass, guys, just so you know. <laughs> I wonder if since it was called Hermitage in the past, the Cinso at least was, so that's where they get the Aj from and Pinot Tage. That could make sense. Yeah, Pinot Noir mixed with Hermitage becomes Pinot Tage, especially if like this was 1925. So like yeah, if it was called. And they called it Hermitage back there, I think. Yeah, oh. that would make sense. And you know, we were saying before we got on the call that I, I mean, so back when I was... 18 ish. Um, I worked at a restaurant um, as a server that had a pinotage and it was like a very, it was very popular. Like everyone loved it. So it was like one of those, you know, wines that everyone, it was on the, by the glass list. It was like every single night, pinotage, pinotage, pinotage. So I was very familiar with it. I drank it. I did, I liked it. Um, I, I strike that. I was, I already said I was, what, 18? I did not drink it. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know where this bar was at. It could be in. Italy. That is true. I was. You didn't there say was a, where it was. There, there was a bar in Italy serving pinotage where I was working at TV. You could have just been in Montreal. You could have been across the border in Canada. We were we just going to Vermont. Like you might as well just uh, been fine. Anyway, the point was when I was young and ignorant and maybe not supposed to be drinking, I thought pinotage was the blend, like the name of the blend. Like if you had a Chianti, that's a blend of Sante Base with other grapes. I thought a pinotage was just like a South African blend. And I have thought that until two days ago when I, no, yesterday, yesterday, when I opened up this bottle um, and actually looked it up to start getting knowledgeable for this episode. And I was like, oh, Pinotage is not the blend. It's actually its own grape. Um, so that, that was just fun though, that South Africa has its own grape that is a blend of, or a cross with um, Pinot Noir. And yeah. so, so, um, but yeah. I don't so, really see it anywhere outside of South Africa, do you? Did you see anything in like your research no. on it? It's, everyone just says everyone just says it's like the native, not the native, but like the the grape particular of special grape of South Africa. No one's like, oh, but they also grow other places. It's a little interesting to me. I mean, maybe there's just not much wine grown in other areas with similar climate to South Africa. So I would think that that would be a good go-to. Um, or if because Pinotage did um, because of this and so and sort of this cross that enabled it to sort of flourish. It just is like an easy growing. It really lended itself to just sort of overproduction. So maybe nobody wanted to um, yeah. try to reproduce it because they were like, there's already enough of it down there in South Africa. Um, yeah, but it's I... a super, sorry. Oh, go on. Oh, no, I was just going to say like that was part of the overproduction. Like it's a super inky grape. So like it just makes super dark wine that then they can kind of stretch and make it so it, it just ha has been meant it's been used to make huge quantities of wine and there hasn't been much particular attention paid to the quality until the past like 20 ish years yeah so. well I remember I used to in college my senior year I would buy this bottle of pinotage from the food co-op downtown city market <laughs> and it was like 10 bucks or less obviously if I was buying it and it had like a cheetah on the label and that's all I can remember I think that's the one that was by the glass at the restaurant. Yeah, that's like, I think one of the mo more popular, like easy to find ones out there because it's like yeah. pretty affordable. It, it's Pinotage. It's like tastes like Pinotage. I mean, that was my first time with it because I remember buying it being like, what the fuck is Pinotage? But also I was like 21 years old and just- and like, it, has, it has a cheat on the label. Um, yeah, and I had a cheat on a label. Yeah. Like, no, that's, and that's sort of, I saw, I drank, you know, enough of it back in the day um that one I think it may have been the same one but that was my last time having it until trying it um this time around and now I'm drinking it's um Baxburg Pinotage sustainably farmed has this pretty purple label um it's 2018 and they do say that this you know is best enjoyed after five years I'm a little bit early to the game um but it said it is um if memory serves, which I mean, it really might not because I was young and, and drinking. Um, <laughs> so like the Pinotage I am remembering was a, was a little bit less, not this is elegant. I wouldn't say elegant. It, was, it had a little bit less nuance to it. It was the sort of that thicker, jammier. Um, yeah. It was heavy, had that fruit forward. It did have that sort of, they mentioned bacon a lot. Um, they talk about Pinotage, that sort of bacon taste um, mixed in there. Um, so this one actually, the bacon still, even though like, if you actually look at, I looked at reviews for this Baxberg Pinotage, um, they don't mention bacon as much in here, in the reviews. They mentioned more like, um, coffee berries, um, yeah. things like that. But that said, I still, for me, what I actually do taste is a little bit of that hint of bacon on the back, which reminds me of the Pinotage I had, you know, 
10 years ago, 13 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, that one, I just remember being thicker and jammier. And this one does have more of the body style, a little bit more approximate if you don't know more. It's not yeah. definitely not quite as light, but it is, uh, it's not quite as dense as what I remember Punitage being. Um, so maybe that's part of, I mean, it could be maybe part of the, the sort of change in production. Um, because what I was able to find and say that sort of this focus on really returning more towards the quality, um, and really trying to cultivate and using different wine techniques to create the wines started around 2000. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. That's, Remember yeah, that time that we talked about going to hike Kilimanjaro together for person day? Yeah, and I got pregnant like yeah, three months later. Yeah. We can, but, we uh, can still, okay. we, we can still do it. I'd like to do Kilimanjaro. But yeah, that was some like awesome like group ladies trip that I found. <laughs> yeah. It went. But I'm thinking like we go up do Kilimanjaro, like head down to South Africa after that, go visit um Francois at Blackwater, see what he's up to. Oh, for, sh- for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Like I'm into it. I mean, yeah, after having no childcare for like three months now, I'm I'm do a, you know, two week getaway whenever we can. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> whenever can we're make, allowed. We can make that happen. Yeah. Enjoy some wine. <laughs> <laughs> so you said yours was sustainable, though, right? Because they, I was like reading today when I was looking at like kind of like the wine laws for South Africa. They're actually very big on sustainable winemaking. Yeah, no, even um, even, my canned, even my canned wine. So the canned wine, I didn't get into it. It's um, so Lubanzi is like a a wine maker. They're not they don't grow any of their own grapes. Yeah, but they source them all from small sustain. They're very big on like their their brand mission statement. Um, yeah, they source them all from fair for life, fair trade, which I'm assuming is a South African certification, fair for life, yeah. fair trade, um, and sustainably farm certified vineyards. Um, and then they give back to a nonprofit. So they're very in sustainability. And then, yeah, the, the Baxberg, even though it has, um, some big history to it in terms of, um, which I thought was kind of fun is that the vineyard itself was founded in the early 1900s by a Lithuanian immigrant who sold his butcher shop in order to buy the vineyard. And it's okay. operated to this day by his grandson. So it's, you know, it's an older okay. An older family run business, but it still also does focus on sustainable practices. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. And it's about Lazy Lucy and our friend Francois. Is he sustainable? It does say integrity and sustainability certified by the Wine and Spirit Board, which is the name of the the um wine law governing board there in South Africa. Like they have a pretty basic system, like the US. They have like a you know, South African wine, they break it down into regions into like, I think it's, what is it? it's regions, great geographic units. So like Western Cape and then other regions and then districts. And then wards is the final one. And that's defined by soil, climate and geological factors. But mine's just like a wine of South Africa. And they say that if it qualifies for like some of those distinctions, there'll be like a white um, label on the capsule. Oh, yeah. Mine has integrity and sustainability certified yeah. by the Wine and Spirit Board. Yeah. Yeah. This one also says on the main label, it says certified carbon neutral, which is. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Mine says that it was named after the bulldog from the winery. Oh. Yeah, uh, <laughs> oh, Lazy resident, Lucy. That's cute. The resident princess in our family, Lucy the bulldog, is not exactly known for athletic nature or serious demeanor. Cute as can be in a favorite in all company like this wine adorable oh gosh you gotta go find francois i have to find francois and his dog (laughs) (laughs) so i mean to get serious again briefly before this all goes you know downhill yeah Um, of course but no but that is i mean i appreciate that that they really have made it like a country i mean maybe it's easier if they have like smaller area of you know wines being grown but like that there really is this emphasis on sustainability For sure. Like at least if they're, I mean, they were kind of given the opportunity like a few times to almost like revamp their wine industry. It wasn't just, I mean, there was like the, they had the beginning and then they went to Phylloxera, which sucked and that's not their fault. Um, And then, you know, uh, apartheid happened and that was like kind of a hard thing because they couldn't export and on top of so many other factors, first of all, but um, 
they were given like a few opportunities to revamp their wine industry for sure. So I think this time around in the more modern age, they had a better opportunity to move to sustainable and new, newer practices and new technology because they're kind of starting from scratch again. They don't have as much of like an entrenched tradition of winemaking. Like some yeah. other countries definitely do for sure. Yeah, no, that is, that's really interesting. And that's something that I actually, like I had seen that the Lubanzi notably because they're not growers themselves that they had, you know, they made a point of sourcing their grapes from, yeah. you know, ethical and um, sustainable sources. Um, but I actually didn't even, it's amazing when you can look at the, like I looked at the label, but I didn't even like the carbon neutral didn't even jump out at me until you mentioned that. <laughs> I was like, yeah, sure. Yeah. Whatever. Bye. <laughs> I don't think mine, mine only says it contains sulfites. So like generic stuff. It do. This one contains sulfites too. Um, yeah. But yeah. I think I was too pissed off that I was like, I taste bacon in here and they don't have any bacon on. They have some little pictures of the things you can taste in here, but there's no oh, that's cute. I'm like, draw some bacon for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you a bacon sticker. Yeah, put it on there. Um, but yeah, but that's, but I do remember that being very distinct about the pinotage that I had when I was younger. And then this one now is that, that bacon, like I, you just don't necessarily taste bacon and red wine all that often. So no, it must be pretty specific to pinotage or like very, like a very big factor of it for sure. Right. No, but it's, I mean, I like bacon, so I'm, I'm not mad about it. So. <laughs> oh, so here's something I did yesterday. Side note before we like totally cut off this episode, but I made my first wine Bloody Mary. Instead of vodka, I used a Cap Bronc and made a house-made Bloody Mary mix, and it was delicious. So I don't drink Bloody Marys in general, so... Neither do I. This, this, this sounds... This, I, I'm not imagining this tasting good. I would imagine making it with, like, white wine, if you're going to make one. We made it with Cap Bronc, and it was just kind of an idea. Um, uh, the wine bar that I frequent down here in Tucson, Revel, um, they don't have a liquor license, but are trying to like do some more types of wine based cocktails since they can't do like anything with gin or rum or anything like that. So we were playing with ideas of like, how can we do some fun stuff? And we made a wine bloody Mary with Cap Bronc and it was pretty fucking cool. About, like final words of Kala for the podcast episode. <laughs> Try a Cap Bronc bloody Mary. I mean, no, they're, 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 that hard. I'm like, now just like put wine in it. It's delicious. It's done. Yeah. Will it wine? Of, there are a lot of good wine cocktails, though. I'm trying to think. Yeah. The ones I'm thinking of have like gin and alcohol. Them, so exactly. That, that, won't, that won't work for you. But no. But I think that's going to be like a new thing for me. Like, will it wine? It's just like, does it taste good with wine in it? I don't know. Well, I mean, <laughs> since my mom so hard sometimes, I've become friends with the white wine spritzer. Um, oh, hell yeah. Yeah. So that's a classic easy drinking <laughs> that's your alcohol a little bit in half get your hydration in there too <laughs> so and then so the one thing i always say about south africa before i go if you guys go to south africa and you're going around different areas you are allowed to carry on wine onto the plane if you're staying within south africa so we flew from cape town to johannesburg to go on safari and we were like trying to buy wine on this wine day we're like well we can't buy too much because like we have to fly and like bring it all back and someone was like oh you can carry six bottles per person on the plane six bottles per person <laughs> per person and at, when we were at i think it was klein Costantia where we bought the vinda Castance, they also were doing a blowout sale on their um like entry level sauvignon blanc which is just like super tasty and easy to drink and so i think it was like seven dollars a bottle or eight dollars a bottle or something ridiculous and so it was good so we eat, we bought like two cases of that, like drank six of the bottles, like in the Airbnb over the next two days. And then each of us carried six bottles on the plane so that we could fly them to our safari lodge so that we could have something to drink when we were in the middle of this safari park. Because everyone needs six bottles. I mean, yeah. I understand that. I mean, and they were still gone by like day two of this thing. But the other thing I learned about South Africa and their airports is we got there before the bars opened at the airport and some lovely bartender was just like, well, if you go to the duty free store there and buy a bottle, you can bring it back here and open it. I don't care. And I was like, Oh, I have bottles in my bag. And she's like, yeah, that works too. And she's like, gave us three glasses and we're just like opening up our own bottles and drinking at the bar. Now I need to go to South Africa. I know. But like, that's well, my travel tip for South Africa is you can carry on wine, six bottles per person on the plane. It's amazing. Well, you know. well when we fly from Kilimanjaro down to South Africa and then do whatever we do, we'll, we'll around have our there, six yeah. bottles. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, can't wait. Cheers to that. Cheers to that. Cheers. All right. I hope you guys I all in- tonight. Yeah. <laughs> I hope everyone enjoyed South Africa. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's just an interesting little <laughs> wine making country that makes a lot of wine. <laughs> I think there's going to be a lot more development with it just because it's been a little bit slower from the new world countries just because of the bumps in the road it's had. But I think there's going to be a lot more cool stuff coming out of there soon. Awesome. Well, yeah. we will re- revisit it, you know, when we're still podcasting in three years. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> All right. Cheers, Betty. Right. Love you. Love you too. Bye.